Well, it's good to be back at Calvary Bible Church this morning. We've been looking forward to this. Really, I had forgotten about Thanksgiving coming up this week. So uh, we can be thankful for what we're not going to experience in light of the message this morning. I've entitled it, Anything But the Fire. Anything But the Fire. On September 11, 2001, it brought to us a horrible reality of two airliners crashing into Twin Towers in New York City. I usually was up by 7 o'clock each morning when we were living back in Arkansas getting ABC Morning News. It was a few minutes after uh, 7 that morning when I uh, turned on the TV and behold, there was a burning tower in New York City. I didn't quite know what to think of it. The announcers weren't quite sure if it was an accident. As I looked, another plane came across the sky. I could see it on television. I thought, well, surely it will pass by, but much to my surprise, it didn't. Instead, there was a bulge on the second tower, and the flames began to leap upward. I realized then that both of these crashes were deliberate. Not too long after that, Mayor Giuliani was approaching the scene of horror, and he looked up and saw what I was seeing on television. That was people plunging to earth, their clothes, their neckties flapping in the breeze behind them as they went downward. If any were on the roof, and I doubt that there were, helicopters could not rescue them because of the intense heat and the smoke and turbulence there was no way for a helicopter to get to the roof if anyone was already on the roof. Those in the building who were not already dead, most of them, at least in the burning area, didn't have access to the uh, elevators. Their cables had been severed by the crash. If they could get to a stairway, they might start down, but some of them couldn't do that. And so as the flames approached and the heat grew more intense, they had to make a choice. Do I want to burn or do I want to leap? And several did leap. It was a horrible thing to witness that. Their instinctive decision under the pressure of the moment was anything but the fire. I'm sure it was not a case of premeditated uh, suicide. I don't think anyone got up that morning and thought, well, you know, things are going so rough with me. I, I'm having it so bad. I think when I get to work today, I'll just jump out and end it all. I'm sure they didn't sit down and think about it very long as the flames approached them. It was just a matter of do I want to suffer the experience of burning to death, or do I want to try to escape? And so they leaped out of those 80 or 90-story floors up and plunged downward to certain death in the pavement below. I didn't think too much about it at the time, but later I got to wondering, uh, what was the spiritual condition of those who chose that way out? If they were saved, we know from the Word of God, they missed the temporal flame, but it was instant death by the terrible impact on the pavement below. As a believer, they were instantly absent from the body, present with the Lord. But then, what about the unsaved who made that choice? They avoided the temporal flame, but upon death, they instantly entered into hell for the beginning of an eternal torment. Hopefully none of us will ever have to make such a choice, not even to escape from a burning building on ground level. I don't think it would be a pleasant experience. But what about your destiny after death? Will it be heaven by the grace of God? or hell because of refusing the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of those who died that day may have been taught by their church that 
Uh, after death, it's a time of purging in the flame in order to get rid of the uh, venial sins that you have committed and for which uh, atonement hasn't been made or you haven't made restitution to your fellow man. They have may have thought uh, immediately upon entering hell, well, this is really purgatory. This isn't really what I'm going to face forever. After due purging, I will be able to enter heaven. Well, God does have a purgatory. I know because I've been there. It's the biblical one found in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, if you would like to turn and read it. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person, and when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The first aspect of God's purging is that in salvation we are purged from our sins. I had that experience as a 12-year-old boy on an August night back in 1936. It's at that time that I came to trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I was forgiven all trespasses according to the Word of God. He took care of all sin, past, present, and future, as far as destiny was concerned. And then there's a second aspect of that purging that's found in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9, 12 through 14. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained on the cross eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? When a person desires God's salvation, they must come to faith in Jesus Christ and know the purging from their sins. They must also, if they are holding on to those works which they consider good, but which God classifies as dead, because a person must be created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The best thing we might do, even religiously, before trusting Christ as Savior is classified by God as a dead work. So even our religious activities, our baptism, our church membership, our doing good from the human point of view, God accounts as dead. You cannot do one thing that God classifies as good until you know Jesus Christ and have been created in Him unto good works. We want to turn this morning to uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, for the balance of the message. Luke, chapter 16. I mentioned that those who may have died by leaping to their death that day, who did not know Christ as their Savior, are already in the place of torment. In Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, we find three horrible realities in view of eternity without Christ. First of all, there is an unrelieved torment. I'll begin reading with verse 19 to pick up the context. Jesus himself gave this truth. He says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, 
the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, the temporary place of punishment at that time, commonly thought of as hell because there was a punishment part, there was a paradise part in Hades. This man is in the punishment part in hell. He lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented, an unrelieved torment. Over in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 11. This pertains to a particular group, but it's true of all the unsaved who end up in punishment. Revelation chapter 14, verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. What's true of those future worshipers of Antichrist is also true of all who die in their sins. On over to chapter 20 and verse 10. 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented. That's a plural verb in the Greek language. They shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So torment is unrelieved. It's unending. I think of high school friends I knew back in the late 19 or early 1940s. I saw some of them recently at a high school reunion. Many who used to meet annually at this or every other year at this reunion already on the list of those who had died. Some of those friends died in World War II. As far as I know, they did not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I've often thought of that, how today they've already been in hell for some 63 or 64 years. That's not pleasant to think about. I knew other men in the Army Air Corps in Italy in World War II, We've had annual reunions for several years now. This last year may have been our next to last one. We schedule one more for Fort Worth, Texas this coming year. That probably will be the last because our ranks are thinning. There aren't too many of us around anymore. So what we see here in Luke chapter 16 is an unrelieved torment. Lazarus and the rich man had met their eternal destiny. And according to what Abraham said to this man, Now he that is Lazarus is comforted, and thou art tormented. No change from that. The second horrible reality is that there was an uncrossable gulf. Verse 26. Verse 26. And beside all this, Beside your present condition, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they who would pass from here to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from there. When Jesus gave this account at that time, Abraham's bosom was a part of Hades. Punishment was the other compartment of Hades. And between those two places in Hades, Abraham said there is a great gulf fixed. There is no crossing over. One cannot pass from one of these conditions to the other. Well, Jesus, when Jesus died on the cross, he went to Hades. Remember his word to the dying thief who said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. 
Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So Jesus went to paradise when he died, whereas the rich man went to punishment. Now since that time, Jesus has ascended into the third heaven. We, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10. Ephesians 4 and verse 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he led captivity captive. He gave gifts to men. And the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 tells of his experience being caught up into paradise. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul is writing of a personal experience of his which God gave him. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot, cannot tell. God knoweth how he was caught up into paradise. So paradise, which at the time of the death of Christ was in the heart of the earth, has been elevated to the third heaven. The Lord Jesus took all of these saints of previous years and dispensations into heaven to be with him. So Paul says, I was caught up into paradise. Now, if there was a great gulf fixed in the heart of the earth between paradise and punishment in the days of Abraham and in the days of the rich man, think how vast a diff distance now between paradise and punishment across outer space. Apparently those in hell can see what's going on in heaven, or at least be aware of it. I'd like to compare two scriptures which might seem to be contradictory. Second Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. Compare that with Revelation 14, 10. Revelation 14 and verse 10. Now, these two verses, as you read them, might seem to be contradictory, that both could not be true. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. This from the presence means from the personal presence, a face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord. Now turning to Revelation 14:10, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Here it's not a face-to-face -face encounter. Here, rather, it's in the sight of, which implies that in eternity future, the unsaved, in addition to being in the place of punishment, will be able to look somehow out across outer space into the present, into the where the Lord is, and see what they have missed. Certainly, the agony of hell would be bad enough. But to be continually reminded of what the sinner has missed by refusing Christ, what a terrible punishment that would be! What a mental anguish, in addition to the physical or soulish anguish of the flames of the lake of fire. Finally, there's a third horrible reality. Not only an unrelieved torment, not only an uncrossable gulf, but an unfulfilled desire. 
actually two desires which cannot be met. Relief from torment is denied. Going back to Luke 16 again, Luke chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, which we've read before. The rich man cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Just how much relief did that man want? He said, send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. How much water would be available from the tip of one's finger? I had a meeting in the Hickory Ridge Methodist Church, my old hometown in Arkansas, right after starting to seminary. My mother had been a member there. I had attended Sunday school as a boy. In fact, my dad was a Baptist in that little town, and my mother was a Methodist, and so I sort of switched back and forth uh, between the two. I didn't know there was any difference back then. Of course, today I'm sure in a lot of all the liberalism you'd recognize a distinctive difference, but uh, I'd go to Sunday school at the Baptist church, and then I'd go to Sunday school at, at the Methodist church. And I was in this meeting uh, staying in my second cousin's home because he was a member of the Methodist Church. And really, I think that's the only reason I got an invitation to preach a series of messages in that church. I got to thinking about this. I must have been bringing a message concerning this. So I went to, went to the bathroom. I plugged up the lavatory and ran a little water in, stuck my finger in the water up about half the length of the fingernailed my index finger and lifted it up and not much was happening. I stuck it in again up the full length of the fingernail, pulled it up and looked, and you could see a drip sort of beginning to form, but nothing happened. I stuck it into the first joint of the index finger, pulled it out slowly, looked at it. Finally, a drop formed and fell off. Let him dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. The agony was so great that even a drop of water would bring a little bit of relief. Well, I think it's Milton's Paradise Lost where these words are found. I haven't been able to check it out. Anyway, I've read these words somewhere. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Well, an unfulfilled desire, relief from torment denied, a second unfulfilled desire, repetition of warning unneeded. This man had another desire in hell, verses 27 to 31. Luke 16, 27 to 31. And he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Have you ever heard an unsafe person flippantly say, I don't want to go to heaven. I don't want all the boring sitting around and listening to angels sing and playing harps. I want to go where my friends are. I want to have a good time. Folks, those in hell don't want anyone else coming. They know what it's like. And this man did not want his brothers coming there. He did not want their companionship as he had known it back on earth. Oh, how the devil has brainwashed people today as they think of eternity and somehow seem to think that in hell they're going to sit around a card table playing cards and drinking beer and having a good time like they did on earth. It's not that way. And if we have any friend who has preceded us and gone to hell, they don't want us coming there. There is no welcome mat in the entrance to hell. Continuing on here, notice how this repetition of warning was unneeded, according to Abraham. Verse 29, Abraham saith unto him, 
They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. There is in the Word of God adequate knowledge of the way of salvation. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, there are people today that don't hear Moses and the prophets. Your evolutionists have denied what Moses wrote in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And some political leaders in Kansas are all disturbed because there might be the teaching of creationism in the schools. And they want to get off the boards of education any men who might want that truth taught along with the fallacy of evolution. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, evolutionists have not listened to what Moses wrote in the inspired Word of God. Of course, Genesis 1 1 is not the only truth that's denied. They don't believe all the prophecies that the prophets gave concerning the first coming, the suffering and death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I doubt there's an evolutionist on the face of the earth that believes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. At least they're denying those portions of Scripture written by Moses and the prophets. So Abraham said to this man, uh, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Beyond that, they can read the New Testament, the New Covenant in the blood of Christ, and know that salvation has been provided. So no further word from God or man is needed. If they reject what Moses wrote, they will reject what the prophets wrote, and they probably will openly deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ from among the dead. One famous pulpiteer from years ago wrote a preacher friend of mine and uh, said, as far as I'm concerned, the body of Jesus Christ still lays buried yonder in a Syrian tomb. And he was well known as a great preacher, so-called, in America. No further word from God or man is needed. If we reject God's word, God's message, whether Moses and the prophets or the Gospels and the epistles of the New Testament, then a person is without hope. Is anything but the fire your philosophy today? I hope so. I think if people's hearts were ever gripped by Holy Spirit conviction, to see and understand what lies beyond death, they would surely want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. I think the thing I was perhaps most conscious of before I got saved that August night back in 1936 was the fact that I was headed for eternal punishment in hell. It was so real to me. I was so miserable during those several days, during that gospel meeting, before I went forward to publicly and openly confess Jesus Christ as my Savior. Well, how are you going to escape hell? There's no exit once you get there. There's only two possible ways of escape from hell. The first one is just don't ever die. People don't go to hell unless they die. But I can't really recommend that way because only two men in all of history have escaped death. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. On the other hand, Elijah was taken by a whirlwind up into heaven. So the chances are not very good in light of the fact that only two men have escaped death. I highly recommend the alternative. Flee for refuge to the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to His purgatory where He purged us from our sins by the shedding of His blood. Where He purges our conscience from dead works that we might serve the living and true God. 
That's the only safe way to go. We should not put off such a decision. Such a decision either. Proverbs 27, verse 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Those people who went to work that morning in the Twin Towers there in New York City, I'm sure they didn't anticipate the horrible thing that happened. And yet, before the day was gone, before high noon, Hundreds of them had perished in the flames. Proverbs 29.1, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. We're given warnings in the book of Hebrews concerning postponing the offering of God in salvation. Hebrews chapter 3, beginning with verse 7. Hebrews 3, 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. In the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test, proved me and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. The rest of going in and possessing the promised land. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 19, so we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. The last verse of the third chapter of John is sort of a terrifying verse. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Is your philosophy today anything but the fire, or through some false teaching by whatever church you might be affiliated with, it's the thought, well, you know, after death you do have to suffer in the fire a little while to be purged from those venial sins that you might finally enter into heaven. The Scripture knows nothing of that supposition, that falsehood. So if you happen to be here today, and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, and the Holy Spirit of God who has been sent into the world to convict, convict men of sin, righteousness, and judgment, if he's tugging at your heart, take this alternative. Don't just presume you'll never die, therefore never enter hell. Flee for refuge to the Son of God. Receive him by faith as your Savior. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today. We're thankful you've made possible that we can be delivered from the wrath to come. Thank you for all of those present here today who have received by faith the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and that gift of eternal life. Father, if any are present who are not yet saved, never been born again, grant, Lord, that they might flee for refuge today to lay hold upon the hope set before them through the provision of your beloved Son. We thank you for this opportunity to open your word today. We pray your continued blessing upon us. Bless this church in their meeting at the close of this service. We pray your blessing upon the evening service also in Jesus' name. Amen.